Hey everyone, this is Joseph with Virtual Studios, and today I'll be going over part one of my Intro to Recursion screencast series. I'm pretty excited about this because I find recursion really fun, and I had a hard time learning it, so hopefully this takes all the pain out of it for you guys. What I'll be, we'll be discussing is what is recursion, why does it seem so freaking hard, and we'll do an example or two in Python, time permitting. So, let's get started. What is recursion? Um, in basic, in the most basic terms, a recursive function is a function defined in terms of itself. Now, what do those look like? Well, we'll see in a minute. But no, before we show an example, that standard recursive functions have two very, very important characteristics. Um, first of all, they have a what's called a simple step, or a simple case. The simple case is usually what indicates to the recursive function that, hey, we need to stop now. And the simple case is something that is determined before you uh, code the function. It's something that you just need to know. You need to know how the recursive function is going to end. This could be a mathematical definition of a simple case, or this might be something that you have to find out for yourself. But finding the simple case usually isn't too bad. It's usually pretty simple. And the second part is that there's a invocation step. That is, um, it calls itself. So whenever you're looking at a recursive function that's been coded, you'll usually see two very distinct parts. The first part is going to be the simple case, and you'll see that they're returning really simple values based on conditions. And then you'll look at the next part of the function and that's where the recursive stuff happens. That's a really common pattern and that's standard recursive function characteristics right there. So let's look at an example. Not necessarily uh, in code, let's just look at one in the mathematics. We'll pick an easy function. So let's define f of x as 2 times f of x minus 1. This is recursive because this value f of x depends on knowing f of x minus 1, but this f is the same function, so it's a function in terms of itself. What does this look like? Let's just plug in some values and see. Let's start with x equals 3. So when x equals 3, f of x, and it's the same thing as f of 3, and everywhere we see an x, we just put a 3. So this equals 2 times f of 3 minus 1, which is the same thing as 2 times f of 2. Now before we go any further, we need to think, hey, we're doing recursive stuff, but when do we stop? You need to make sure you have a simple case first. If, you're not have, if you don't have a simple case, then the recursive function is going to keep on going. It's not going to be useful at all. So if you ever find yourself working on a recursive function and you haven't declared your simple case, you need to stop and then figure out what your simple case is, which is exactly what I just did. So our simple case for this function is going to be, I'm just telling you, this is how I'm defining it, is going to be f of 1 equals 2. All right, so let's keep going. We have 2 times f of 2, but we don't know what f of 2 is. So let's keep going. Let's see what happens when x equals 2 f of x equals f of 2, because we just put 2 everywhere we see x. So this is 2 times f of 2 minus 1, which is the same thing as 2 times f of 1. Now we do know what f of 1 equals. So we found a place where we can actually stop. This is where the recursive process stops. And we can substitute 2 into f of 1. So this equals 2 times 2. So just for cleanliness, let's just write it again. f of 2 equals 2 times 2. And we knew that f of 3 equals 2 times f of 2. We didn't know what f of 2 was at the time, but we know now. Because we went all the way down to the simple case. And we know that f of 2 is the same thing as 2 times 2. 
So that's just 2 times 2 times 2. That looks like a 3, 2. So if you look at the pattern, you see that it's actually just 2 multiplied 3 times. Generally speaking, it's 2 multiplied x times. Which can be represented as 2 to the x. And that part isn't necessarily important, but it's nice to be able to identify patterns because that's all recursion really is, identifying patterns. The fact that this function, this recursive function, is equivalent to 2 to the x doesn't mean much to us right now, except that we can find things to be defined recursively when we didn't know that they could be before. And that'll come up whenever we're discussing the Fibonacci sequence later. So we have an example of a recursive function. And let's move on. So why is recursion so hard at times? Especially learning, recursion seems like the most difficult thing in the world because you just don't have a real grasp on it. You just don't know when you've got it. And the reason why, as this first point indicates, is that you don't trust it. You almost can't trust it. You can't trust recursion whenever you're just learning it because you don't understand it. You don't know what's going on here. You don't have that way of thinking about things. But, in an almost recursive fashion, the only way you can really come to trust recursion is just to have faith in it. Just, just, just trust it. Just do it. You need to take a step back and look at the big picture. Otherwise, as the second point indicates, you'll confuse yourself greatly. If you are the kind of person that likes to analyze um, to a great extent, which most people that do programming are, then you're going to be tempted when analyzing recursive functions to echo out where you are in the recursive function. And that is the easiest way to get yourself lost. Don't try to analyze what the recursive function does at every little step. What you need to do is analyze what the recursive function does in the grand scheme of things. If you fail to see the big picture, as the last point indicates, then recursion seems extremely hard. But when you step back, take a step out of the code, and see the big picture, instead of stack tracing all the time, then it becomes much more simple. It's a much easier process. And we're going to demonstrate that. Let's look at the Fibonacci sequence. I'm sure most of you have seen the Fibonacci sequence before at least once. Let's go ahead and write it out. I'll write out the first few terms. You just add the previous two terms. You start with 1 and you add the previous two terms. So 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13. I don't know why my, my pen became a mouse pointer. There we go. 8 plus 13 is 21. 21 plus 13 is 34. And that's enough. In fact, I want to make a table out of this. I find making tables makes the recursive pattern recognition much easier. So we have n, and we'll say this is Fibonacci of n, where the Fibonacci function is just the nth Fibonacci number. Mathematically, it's actually defined that there is a zeroth Fibonacci number, which is just zero. And the first one is one. These are defined. more specifically, predefined. So these would make a really good candidate for a simple case. Let's move on. Let's just uh, move the values from the sequence over to the table. So in 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we just add the previous 2. 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. We need to make that look like a 5. There we go. Let's examine this a bit. Let's look at the sixth Fibonacci number. So Fib of 6 is equal to 8. More specifically, how did we get that 8? Well, we added 3 and 5 from before. So Fib 6 equals 3 plus 5, and that's believable, because 3 plus 5 does equal 8. But more specifically, what is 3 and what is 5? If we look at this table, 
we see that 3 is the Fibonacci, the fourth Fibonacci number, and 5 is the fifth Fibonacci number. And we can do a direct substitution over here. So 3 equals Fib of 4. Let's see, N, we have 3, and the N is 4, plus Fib of 5. At this point, you can see this is clearly recursive because we have fib of some number defined in terms of fib and some other number. Now we need to generalize the Fibonacci sequence, so I suggest going down until we see a very clear pattern. Let's do fib 5. The Fibonacci of 5 is actually 5. But how do we get to that 5? If we look to the table over here, we got to it by 2 and 3. But specifically, it's Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 4. So yeah, Fibonacci of 3. And is 3, Fibonacci of 3 is 2, and 2 is right there, so we're doing things right. At this point, we can definitely look and see a pattern. We have 6, 4, 5, 5, 3, 4. Let's generalize this. Fib of x equals Fib x minus 2 plus Fib x minus 1. I arrived to that conclusion based solely upon the pattern. But this has to stop, right? We have our simple cases here. Fibonacci of 0 is not a recursive thing, it's actually just 0. And Fibonacci of 1, equally non-recursive, is just 1. These are predefined, so when I said they'd make a good candidate for a simple case, well, they were. These are the simple cases. So if you wanted to mathematically define this precisely, you could say uh, Fibonacci of x equals, let's say, x when x is between 0 and 1. Or let's just say when x equals 0, x equals 1. And Fib x minus 2 plus fib x minus 1 when x is greater than or equal to 2. So we have defined the recursive process by looking at the pattern. Now because of this, the coding is the easy part. We're going to go ahead and code this in Python. So we had Fibonacci of x. Looking at our simple cases, we said it's just x whenever x is 0 or x is 1, because if you look at these, Fibonacci of 0 is 0, Fibonacci of 1 is 1, so Fibonacci of x is just x whenever x is 0 or 1. And we can easily code that. If x equals 0, or x equals 1, we return x. Else, if we just look at our pattern recognition, we return fib x minus 2 plus fib x minus 1. Alright, let's print out the seventh Fibonacci number. Oops, I have a typo here. Okay, let's check it out. 13, and it works. And let's just do the sixth, just to be safe, and that's eight. So there we go. We have shown how recursion can be extremely simple once you step back and look at the big picture. So this is part one of the series, and part two will be coming soon. Thanks for watching.